Let's begin by talking about the markets uh, today in the session. This Thursday, the Nifty has seen its biggest single session decline in almost two months. It has closed below 25,300 eventually. And among the top losers today, there was BPCL, there was Sriram Finance as well. But even in the broader markets or even the sectoral indices, we've ended the Thursday session in the red. Sectorally, of course, realty has declined the most. But uh, on the contrary, we're seeing oil prices and uh, oil price futures jumping up. So all of this is in play right now. Let's discuss uh, what is likely the direction the markets are likely to take, uh, both from a Wall Street perspective, also what our own markets are doing. And to discuss this, Anurag Singh is joining us uh, from Chicago, managing partner to Ansid Capital, along with Mayuresh Joshi. He's head of equity at uh, MarketSmith India. Great to have you, gentlemen. Mayuresh. This plunge we've seen today, 1,700 points on the Sensex. We've wiped out 10 lakh crore rupees in market cap. So between global and domestic factors, what are you attributing today's fall to? Evening, Vikram. I think it's a combination of both, right? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, globally, uh, the uh, geopolitical tensions and the uh, expected escalations on what probably happens between Israel and Iran is keeping market on uh, tighter roads. Uh, uh, but if the escalation is not... Um, as uh, wide as the markets believe it is uh, with the fall that we witnessed today, there should be decent amount of uh, uh, retrieve and reprieval, reprieval that the market should probably see. Liquidity still remains extremely strong on the domestic front. Obviously, with the China stimulus that has probably come through, the under ownership of Chinese uh, equities uh, has attracted a lot of foreign flows towards China. And how does that play out in terms of Chinese macro data over the next few months uh, would be very, very interesting to watch. Uh, U.S. data has remained strong. So I think the expectations of a soft landing in the U.S. Uh, is something as a base case scenario the markets believe in. Uh, but I think two counts. Uh, one, in terms of the presidential elections in the U.S., uh, our own state elections in India, and how corporate other things are expected to play out in the Indian context. Uh, they have been a little bit patchy last quarter. It might be a little bit soft this quarter as well. U.S. earnings are also expected to remain a little bit soft in this quarter. And therefore, I think the markets will look forward to earnings as a base case scenario, apart from the macros that we're probably looking at. So yeah, volatility might continue for the Indian markets uh, along with global queues. Uh, but the large part, if a correction does come through, uh, there will be a good amount of buying that will probably come through. So not seeing a structural decline for decline and you did say that uh, liquidity is strong uh, despite the volatility is liquidity go going to hold us in good stead is that what you believe Mayuresh? yes so i think domestic flows have remained extremely strong they yes. continue to remain strong as we speak uh, mm -hmm. foreign flows might as i said uh, move yeah. uh, a tad bit towards china but domestic liquidity will continue remaining strong let me take it across to anurag now that investor concerns are growing after iran has launched those ballistic missiles against israel earlier this week uh, Anurag, the biggest fear is that an escalation is going to disrupt oil supplies from the region. How real is that uh, fear to you? So, uh, Vikram, partly the the fear is justified, right? Also, I think adding to the fact that oil was already at a level, you know, below 70 something, which no analyst actually, and we, we, we are not so much of oil ex analyst or, you know, we don't have expertise on geopolitics. But uh, I can tell you that none of the analysts had predicted that, you know, oil will basically go below 70 and that was a bit of a low. So I think somewhere uh, there was a catch up to be had. And so expect the oil to be between 70 and 80 at least. And after the US elections, of course, it will also find its level based on the policy that the new government adopts. But uh, I think in terms of Middle East, uh, Vikram, the markets have really moved on from there. And there are a couple of reasons why. One is, uh, you know, that uh, is, you know, no matter how much we debate, this is not a battle of equals. Iran is not prepared to take on a full-fledged war with Israel. It was largely counting on doing some skirmishes here and there through proxies and then expecting the international community to just come in and, you know, settle the fire. Now, that has been missing and that's putting the Iranian government on the back foot because there's no international community now coming to the rescue. Especially in the US, if you see, the president is almost missing in action. And, and, and in that sense, there is no decisive direction from United States. No, I mean, but do you do see a correlation take... between uh, the uh, US presidential elections and what we are seeing in Iran-Israel, this conflict escalating? 
hundred percent, hundred percent. Because I mean, the moment so look, uh, Israel uh, needed to uh, take a decisive uh, conclusion to this kind of ever going threat and wars from Iranian proxies. And now that the government in uh, in United States is not so decisive, and there is a bit of a limbo here, uh, it is probably the best. And by the way, it coincides with Netanyahu making a trip uh, to, to United States and meeting both the sides of the aisle, right? So, I mean, they are in a point where nobody is going to stop them for now. And so I think till October, November, this is the best time they have to kind of take any sort of decisive action that they can, especially when Iran is also not prepared, right. Vikram. Yes, yes. So, Mayuresh, looking at uh, that kind of backdrop uh, with the conflict and tensions rising in West Asia, uh, I was talking about crude oil. How big a threat is that really for India? Higher crude oil prices, they were trending down already and now we're seeing a bit of a rise, but is the rise big enough to throw our markets out of whack? No, not, not at this juncture, Vikram. So, unless I think it goes out of hand and it crosses that $85, $90 a mark, uh, uh, India's dynamics probably do not change uh, quite significantly. At the same time, I think the flexibility in buying Russian food uh, which also probably exists on the table, uh, which also gives uh, uh, a kind of a reprieve in terms of our uh, forex reserves, uh, because payment probably happens uh, in Indian rupees as well. So to that extent, I think uh, until oil actually crosses over the 8590 mark, uh, uh, doesn't seem to bother India that much. Um, China's bumper stimulus, uh, and of course uh, there was. Uh that bit that came from uh, Eurasia as well as uh, one of the key factors. Uh, that came in recently and through it, China's central bank now pumping in billions of dollars to support their stock market, support their policy rate cuts, trying to boost bank liquidity. And yes, even stabilize their long-standing property crisis. They've uh, got this 50 point basis point interest rate cut for mortgage holders. Are these measures going to raise Chinese equities? And could that come at the cost of Indian equities, you think? Of... Oh, that is to me? Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, Vikram. Um, so look, 100%. There is, you know, I've been a strong believer that everything is good at a price, right? So while Indian markets and Indian story is good, uh, and, and there's no question about it, I think the markets that are, had run up or had priced in a little bit too much of optimism. At the same time, China was trading at multiple of, price earning multiple of nine, Right. Look at, I mean, I understand some pessimism, but these companies are, um, you, you, you know, operating at a multiple of nine, whereas these are still cash generating companies and big giants. Right. So possibly, you know, there is very limited that can go wrong from that price. So I think a revival was due. And I think all the markets were looking for was a decisive directional view from Chinese government that look, they, you know, we care about the markets. And I think even China doesn't, I mean, look, they have a pretty uh, a firm government which wants to be a leader in almost every field. I don't think they like this idea that India is really gaining traction on the MSCI indices and it is almost about to beat China on the weightages. So I think some re reaction was bound to happen. And I think that's really, uh, they've really set the ball rolling here. I think China at 20, 24% of the MSCI emerging market, that was too low for the size of the economy. That needs to get back to at least about 30%. And so there's a revival to be had there. I understand China still may not be as richly valued as India is for various reasons, and which are fairly justified. But I think uh, at this point, the trade-off was pretty clear that China needs a bit of a revival and India needs a bit of a... Uh, time correction at least, if, if not a value correction. Okay, but uh, value correction is something that, uh, Mayuresh, do you think that could happen now that uh, you're seeing that kind of, uh, I don't know if you can call it pressure build up from the Chinese equities. At this point in time, you said that domestic equity is looking strong, our liquidity is good. But uh, what about uh, the competition that Chinese equities hold for the Indian equities? Obviously, I think valuations are dirt cheap for Chinese equities, no two ways about it. And the kind of moves that you've probably seen, uh, under ownership uh, of Chinese equity by global funds. Uh, I think clear testimony of them buying into China with the hope of uh, stimulus actually playing out positively for a whole host of sectors and companies within those sectors as well. Having said that, uh, domestic liquidity, as I said, we can remain strong, expect it to remain strong as well. Earnings should come back uh, a tad bit more strongly in the second half. We've got decent monsoons and therefore rural discretionary revival 
uh, should be on the cards. Uh, domestic sectors and domestic cyclicals uh, should continue doing well. Uh, expectations of private capex coming back uh, is something that uh, the market probably believes in uh, over the next few uh, couple of quarters as well as a start. Uh, and therefore, I think uh, uh, there might be some element of disruptions uh, if Chinese micro data starts coming to be a little bit more stronger over the next few months, the next couple of quarters. Uh, uh, let's see how that evolves. Uh, but till that point of time, uh, I think India is still probably looking decent enough, uh, both from a domestic uh, Stand. And Mayuresh, while we were expecting a short-term impact of the new FNO norms that SEBI introduced, uh, they've limited the weekly expiries to one per exchange, uh, they've increased contract sizes, just raising entry barriers to protect small investors, that's clear. But do you think this hit on retail sentiment could run deeper and reduce trading volume significantly now, going ahead from here? I think that seems to be the case because mm. I think whoever I was speaking to uh, seems to suggest that there might be a 20-25% cut in volumes. Uh, but uh, Vikram, I think Indian investors are uh, far more savvy. Uh, so I think they will adjust to the new norms over the next few uh, months as they start kicking in. Uh, volumes might go lower, uh, but uh, in my opinion, I think uh, it is the same move that SEBI has probably done to protect retail investors. But I think uh, retail investors uh, will, will find a way in. Yeah, <laughs> through, through brokers and strategies. Well. Conversion rises every time we see and sense the fear of escalating geopolitical tensions uh, here in India. The losses have been pretty secular, Mayuresh. All sectors have taken a beating. Can you identify some safe spaces for investors now that uh, one could take cover under? I think Anurag was just mentioning that uh, time correction and if price correction happens, I think it will be a welcome move. I think a lot of people are waiting for that price correction to come. Right, to exactly. And we've been waiting for a long time, haven't we? Exactly. I think last three years, I think the maximum correction has been 5%. <laughs> so to that extent, I think domestic cyclicals, Vikram, look, look uh, decent enough. Yes, uh, our, our sense is that uh, selectively, capital goods, selectively, cement stocks as an example, uh, infra stories, uh, water and waste management stories within these spaces uh, should do well. Uh, banks might be uh, in a phase of consolidation because we'll probably need to see how deposit growth and deposit mobilization actually takes place. Uh, and in a rate cut scenario, I think that scenario is going to be even more difficult. Uh, so I think how banks will probably react uh, in terms of earnings is something to be watched out for. So we're keeping that on our watch list uh, with how Q2 numbers and Q3 numbers will play out. Uh, last but not the least, I think a little bit of defensives, uh, some flavor of pharma and uh, IT uh, selectively also should be kept up. The losses aren't uh, very big on Wall Street uh, right now, Arunrag. Anywhere between four tenths and about uh, seven tenths of a percentage point across the three major indices, the Dow, the Nasdaq and the S&P. Uh, do you think any kind of pressure could persist on Wall Street right now with all the factors that are at play? No, Vikram, unlikely because uh, I think we are sitting in a comfortable situation uh, here. Most of the corrections... I mean, index can be deceiving. I keep saying, uh, you know, the index has been largely held up by seven stocks. But beneath the index, uh, there has been extensive corrections across all sectors. And they are now kind of very ripe to kind of rise again. So you might not see a big movement at an index level because the big seven are kind of stagnant or correcting mildly. But I think rest of the market is showing huge resurgence and that's happening almost on every day, everyday basis. I don't see a, see a big uh, uh, threat or near term uh, disruption to the markets, Vikram. Baseline story is Federal Reserve is, uh, is in control. Inflation is in control. They are cutting rates. Economy has survived the biggest inflation it saw uh, in last 40 years. And from here on, Fed has all the tools to really come and take charge of the market. So I think it's pretty clear that uh, the direction in this case is pretty much uh, uh, up. And, uh, it, you know, it might not rise at that pace because of the composition of the index. So Well, if any direction has to come, I think uh, next for the U.S. market is going to be from the American voter when uh, the presidential election results are out. I think that's something that we're watching for with bated breath. Possibly. Uh, yes. Yes. Mayurash and uh, Anurag, it's always a pleasure getting in your perspective on the markets, uh, both domestic and global. Uh, such a pleasure having you on board today as well. Thanks very much for joining us. If you like this video, then like, share and subscribe to ET Now.